Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength. That I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. The Bible says in Luke chapter 12, In the meantime, they were gathered together in an innumerable multitude of people, in so much that they trod on one another. He began to say unto his disciples, first of all, he says, beware of the living of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Somebody shout hallelujah. We start in a setting, and I told people, take heed of the words Jesus speaks when he's with the three. Take heed of the words Jesus speaks when he is with the twelve. Take heed of the words Jesus speaks when he's in the multitudes. Because each of those words carries its own revelation and emphasis by the Christ to the intent that his desired purpose will be given to the people that need it. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so in this setting we see Jesus in the multitude of people. He turns firstly to his disciples. The multitude was there. What the scriptures don't tell us is how many had those words. But we can all rightly assume that it was spoken in a multitude. Okay? But to how many that had or to how will he turn, because the Bible doesn't tell us he took them aside, but the Bible says he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, it probably looks like it was a huge congregation. He turns to the disciples, or those that were disciples. We don't know how many were. It probably could have been more than 12, because the scripture don't tell us there were the 12 and said, take heed or beware of the living of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And he says, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. The message version says, you can't keep your true self hidden forever. Before long, you'll be what? Exposed. You can't hide behind a religious mask forever. Sooner or later, the mask will slip and your true face will be known. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so this is to the Pharisee. If you're a writer of nuggets, I want to give you a nugget. I want you to write this. Worship and doctrine define our understanding of truth and consequent submission to a particular ministry. So worship, the Bible says, and doctrine define our understanding of truth and consequent submission to a particular ministry. In other words, if somebody asks you, why are you submitted to funeral ministries? Why are you submitted to the church where you go? How did you join that church? How did the Lord lead you to funeral? Why did he lead you to funeral of all churches? Are you hearing me? Majority of you have those answers. Because you have heard God, you have seen, the Bible says if at least you doubt the words that I'm speaking, <laughs> look at the works, you understand? There's enough evidence of God in this ministry. How many of you believe it? There's enough evidence of God in this what? In this ministry. But if you ask a person, why are you in this ministry? What would they answer? It is how we worship how I worship God, okay, and the doctrine that I teach. That is why you are attached to the ministry. Somebody shout hallelujah. We don't submit to particular ministries based only on a dream. Someone can sit in an organized ministry and then dream when some pastor is talking to them, and then they conclude that that pastor is their man of God. That's the generation we're living in. 
You understand what I'm saying? And the sad thing is the next day you dream another one. Then after two years you dream another one. Then after four years you dream a what? Another one. So who of them is your authority? Because some people move by that. I dreamt, therefore. No. Submit to a ministry because you know the doctrine and the God they worship. Are you hearing me? You see the mode of worship and you can agree to that mode of worship. Praise God. Shout hallelujah. Now when he says take heed of the leaven of the Pharisees. Let's go back in context. What is leaven? Huh? Leaven is yeast. What does leaven do to dough? It puffs up. Okay? Leaven does what? It puffs up. Leaven puffs up. It puffs up the dough. And then the dough becomes what? Bigger. What happens if that dough becomes bread? Okay? And then you press that bread. What happens? It shrinks back. That means that that puff is vain. It's vain puffing. Okay? And that is the metaphor of pride, the spirit. Are you hearing me? Because pride boasts of itself beyond its true measure. So you see a piece of bread this size, but when you put it on a weighing scale, it is light. Why? Because there is something that pops it up. Are you following me? And so that pride is the spirit that relates to living. It's the typification of that living, of that yeast. Okay? Now, note this. The spirit of pride, if you're writing, the spirit of pride is hatched by deception and is the parent of all hypocrisy. Are you hearing me? The spirit of pride is hatched by deception and is the parent of all what? Hypocrisy. In other words, pride exists where deception is. Are you hearing me? And hypocrisy exists where pride is. So, Deception precedes pride, and pride precedes hypocrisy. And the definer here of this pride is the measure that is puffed up beyond the actual measure. Okay? This thing in its own sense weighs 20 grams, but it is puffed up. It looks like it weighs a kilo, but when you carry it, it's actually weighing 20 grams even though it's puffed up. That's the essence of pride. Because when the spirit of pride sits on an individual, they exercise themselves in matters beyond themselves. They exercise themselves in things too high for them. That's a haughty spirit. That's pride. Are you hearing me? There cannot exist a proud full person, a proud person, and there is no hypocrisy to them and there is no nature and sort of pride that does not precede deception are you hearing me and deception varies according to your understanding of truth are you following what i'm saying deception varies according to your understanding of truth there are people that can easily be dissuaded off the course by simple mere words and there are people you just don't simply come and toss are you hearing me? That is why the essence of the fivefold ministry is to perfect you for the work of ministry, the edification of the body, that you might reach that full state, the full measure of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that you might not be babes again, which are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are people in this world who are just there to mislead some people out of their destinies. Out of their destinies out of their destinies out of their destinies somebody shout hallelujah and some people are not sensitive when they are being misled now that's the hypocritical spirit that is at work in those who dissuade others from the truth now 
when Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's always referring them to as hypocrites. And the Greek word for hypocrites is hypocrites. It means actors, a stage player, a dissimulation, a role player, a pretender. That's where hypocrite is. Someone who pretends. Someone who stage plays. Someone who acts. Someone who gives one impression, but yet is of another person behind. That is why in Luke he says that nothing hidden of you will not be revealed. In the message version he says that you can't keep your true self hidden forever. Before long you will be exposed and you can't hide behind a religious mask forever. Sooner or later the mask will slip off and your true face will be known. That is to us ministers most especially, but also to the church as well. That we cannot be hypocrites. Because whether it's hypocrisy, there's a pride. And pride goes before a what? Fall. And before pride is deception. So Jesus has a problem with a Pharisee. And then you see him many times addressing them with some of the most um, angry statements or words that he could speak to human nature. Oh yes, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Oh yes, Jesus came to die for our sins. But when it comes to the Pharisee, he damns them. He curses them. He speaks hard words to them because Jesus hates the spirit of religion. Somebody shout hallelujah. Because religion is not cast out. The spirit of religion is not something you go and put a hand on a man and say, spirit of religion, get out. It's not something you cast out of a person. Are you following what I'm saying? The spirit of religion is not something you cast out of an individual. It is something either that is stowed out of an individual or by an experience with God is flushed out of an individual. Jesus never in scripture has ever instructed the church to deal with the spirit of religion. He has never. Are you following what I'm saying? Because we're not supposed to deal with them that way. But there is a way. And I've started war on it. Okay? Now... Because of that kind of hypocrisy and that kind of deception, Jesus sees the spirit that is at work in the Pharisee and the Sadducee, and he loves them. He is disturbed with the spirit at work in them. And it's the same thing that I find every time I meet people of religion. And I know that after this service, some of you are going to hate religious, not the individual, but the spirit. You're going to hate religion, the spirit, even the more. Not the person, but the spirit even the more now when he's talking about them he starts to open a conversation in Matthew 23 verses 13 and he says but woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for you neither go in yourselves neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in when a man has a spirit of religion, when they're a Pharisee, that spirit of a Sadducee, that hypocritical spirit, that proud and boastful spirit, that deceiving spirit. The Bible says that they stand on the door to dissuade innocent souls from entering into higher graces and deliverance and answers and breakthrough. And they themselves also don't go in and so they stand on the door. They're likened to, how many of you have heard of what they call crimes of passion? A crime of passion is where people love each other, two lovers, a man and a woman, love each other, okay? And then, for example, a woman says, I'm done with you. And a man says, if you can't love me, nobody will what? Will love you. And he gets a knife and stabs that person. To death hacks them to death why because he's saying if I can't have you no one will what will have you if you want to marry me nobody will what will marry you and there are people like that in this world I sent a video and then I went on YouTube and saw five or six videos of Chinese 
spitting on elevator buttons and places of public use to make sure they can infest as many as they can with the coronavirus. And in one video, they showed a whole family of about five of them. They entered an elevator and started spitting everywhere to make sure that they can infect others with the virus. Those are not born again. That's how evil a human being can be. But to be a new creation and a child that is born of love, to get a knife and stab a woman because she refused to receive you in love, I wonder how you even say you loved them. And that's how far the world has been misled in this idea called love. It is sung, it is written, it is spoken of, but believe me, many people don't know love. God is love. Jesus has been rejected by men. He has not stopped loving men because they reject him. On the contrary, I think this is the part where you say, I love that person enough to let them go. Isn't it? That's love. If your happiness is not with you, then if they can find happiness elsewhere, that's what love is. Because love seeks the better for the other, not for the self. It vaunteth not itself. It does not behave itself unseemly. But that's human nature. Are you hearing me? And God gives an example of this hypocrisy and he says it is with the Pharisee and the Sadducee. Sadly, this hypocrisy is with us ministers of the gospel. Us ministers of the gospel. And some dissuade innocent lives. Innocent lives. There are many times, the Lord is my witness, I have lost sleep praying for particular individuals because I see that they have been deceived by somebody or something. And that simple deception is going to alter the rest of their destiny. And they will never know it. And they will ask God questions. And they will never get answers. But because somebody altered their destiny by deception, by hypocrisy, are you understanding what I'm saying? There are people I've spent nights praying for. And there are some, the Lord will tell me, this one, let go. They will never change. And you just let them go. But you know their end. For a father, it is so painful. I can never tell you. And some of those are people you have invested your life into. You are on their deathbeds when they were dying. And somebody tomorrow is dissuaded from the faith. And they even turn. They turn. A man of God a couple of years ago, I helped this fellow in ministry. He was stuck. He called me and said, come and help me. I helped him in ministry. And I remember he comes to me and says, Apostle, my ministry stuck. I just began Fanero. And Fanero was flying. I get this fellow. I talk to him, oh, how do I build? I tell him, do this, do this, do this principles, do that. Align your administration, do this. Oh, thank you very much, it worked. What I did not know, some of this guy's members started coming to Fanero, and I didn't know that. And then I had a little girl in the ministry, whom he calls, and tells this girl, oh, don't go back to Fanero. The fellow I helped, don't go back to what? To Fanero. In Fanero, the account, the Lord has showed me, this is a man saying that the Lord has revealed to him that uh, some cult guy in Kampala laid hands on me, that I have snakes in my house, and Simanya have dedicated people to what? And this girl got so scared because the man, Simanya, he fears God, I don't know. And then I'm hearing she's calling church members, flee, flee. The man with sat under, I looked at the girl. She was stable as a pillar. And somebody deceived this innocent girl. And then she started calling church members to flee Sodom before it falls. 
Yeah, and there was a prophecy that Fanero was going to end over that year even. You understand? The next I heard, she left the ministry, was impregnated, got married to a Catholic man, left the church, even where she was. Now, where she was, she was hurt in that ministry. She can't come back to Fanero because she can't enter a devil worshippers ministry. And she's married to a non-believer had a child out of wedlock and she does not see that something is already wrong with that equation but I don't blame that girl my problem is with a man who woke up that day and out of sheer jealousy spoke such words about me because that was the day for me I concluded two things because you can say about me, but me, I know myself. So even me, I have to make a conclusion based on what you've said. One, I don't have a snake. That one, I know. <laughs> Two, no cult in Kampala laid hands on me. Even me, that one, I know. That one, people don't know, but me, I know. You understand what I'm saying? So already on my conclusion, I said there are two things. Either he's not a man of God, and there's another thing on him. And if it is so, in the end, it might take 10 years, it might take 20 years, it might even take a hundred years, but he shall be shown for who he is. That one I'm sure. I'm not worried. Because that doesn't shake Fanero. No. No. But the other thing would be, if he's a man of God, then he's very immature. And then now I feel sorry for everyone under him, because no student can ever go above their master. You understand? That means... If he's that, eh? what about those he's pastoring? You understand, or ministering to? You understand what I'm saying? But somebody did that, and what seemed like a small story became so big that one or two, three people left also. But those ones, I never follow them. Uh -huh. Because by the time someone can tell you something that they can't prove on doctrine and worship, you understand what I'm saying, eh? You can only know a man by his fruit. Okay, if you can't believe me, you bring a lame man. You understand what I'm saying? But our generation, men who open blind eyes and do miracles are the wrong ones. Which is okay. That didn't affect Fanero. Uh -uh. Fanero has kept growing. You understand what I'm saying? But here is my pain. I lost a child. He lost a statistic. Because he left his ministry too. But I lost a child. I'm still grieving for my child. And he can never take that away from me because I'm still grieving for my child. Up to today, I'm still grieving for my child. But not everyone who lives is mine. So I also know that. But that one was mine, I knew. You understand what I'm saying? There was a ministry in this nation. Again, in this ministry, we don't mention names or ministers. But we can use certain examples for our learning. Are you hearing me? There was a ministry, a church in this nation, that started teaching on its altars that Fanero was a cult. I'm just giving you an example. And that doesn't bother me at all, by the way. Because there is a cassis that comes later and will just... You understand, eh? Sometimes you just let them grow together. Hey, the chaff and the wheat. You just let it. One day, something will sift some people out of the system without even you saying anything. So, never fight for yourself. Okay? So, this ministry was writing about us. And in there, there was an elder in that ministry who had a son in that ministry who was raised in the ministry that preaches true doctrine whose son was a drummer in the church where he was raised in the true ministry which attacks the false ministry and during that time of course some people had paid newspapers to malign us and speak evil about us and their lord was spoken and we had we never responded so during that time a girl joined our ministry when Fanero had just begun three months into the ministry she had a relationship with the boy who is a drummer in that church which calls Fanere cult whose father is an elder in that church 
So she was dating this young man. And then they had a relationship. And uh, one day the girl decided to call the relationship quits because it was not working. She didn't quit because she was coming to Fanero. They weren't fighting over faith. They just had the little fights why generations have. Never do small things. Hey, oh, you didn't reply my text. Carry that. I don't think I... You think something like that. So, they break up. And when they do, this young man says, if I can't have you, nobody will. He went somewhere, called the girl, met her, confiscated her phone, and cut her neck and killed her. In cold blood, he killed somebody's daughter. In cold blood, cold blood, the son of an elder who was both a drama and raised in a church that preaches truth, killed a girl who had just joined Fanero three months. If your child can sit under a teaching all his life, and wake up and kill a person just like that, then there is something. That means Jesus never entered this boy's heart. Now, when the ministry discovered that the girl they had killed came from Fanero, that ministry never spoke about us again. Only because the boy had killed this girl. If it was the other way around, yes, I had the same response. You understand what I'm saying? That was enough, okay. A foolish man in the name of an apostle in Kampala at the immediate demise of this dear girl while we were mourning for her death and their parents and family was dying in grief goes on the internet and says, I prophesied that Fanero sacrifices people. Before they discovered who had killed the girl, before police had gotten to the conclusion of investigations on who killed the girl, the moment it came out, it began by a foolish newspaper that wrote, Fanero girl hacked to death on her way to Fanero service in Ginger on Friday. How about Uganda? Is Fanero on Friday? No. Are Fanero services in Ginger? No. But an article was written that a Fanero girl had been murdered her neck had been decapitated, had been cut, slit on her way to Ginger for a service in Fanero. That was meant to give the public an impression that there was something about her death that Fanero had a connection to. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This foolish guy who calls himself an apostle, an apostle, goes on social media and writes, I told you, it is evident that Fanero Ministries is growing by sacrificing people. That I killed an innocent girl's life to grow my ministry. And this fellow calls himself an apostle. In town, they still address him as an apostle. That was one of the hardest periods of my life. You don't know how many parents phoned me on the streets and wanted to beat me. People hurled insults at me because I came to kill their children. While police was investigating, as already 
a suspect into a murder. And who is fueling this? An apostle. An apostle. My name was tainted. A person meets you and they don't want to come near you because they see death. Some of you, you need to be in my shoes for one day and you understand what we go through to stand on the pulpit every day to preach the gospel to you. Some of you need to know that we no longer have lives of our own. You understand? That we don't even know how we'll raise our own children because of people. Somebody said that, that I killed an innocent girl. They say that. And when he wrote that, I was in the U.S., they sent me all of these newspapers, the fellow's Facebook article and everything. I grieved. Fanero Ministries, we went there and mourned. People started sending messages that this is a big deal. Apostle must come out and tell us how did the girl going for Fanero service die. Newspapers started putting pressure on us. You must respond and explain how did somebody's daughter die when she was going for a funeral service. And of all, what looks like a ritualistic sacrifice, her neck was slit. And I said three things. I said I'm not going to answer for three reasons. One, I said if anybody was seeking the truth, they would have found it. Why? Because we have a website. It would show our times of service. There is no service that we have had outside Fanero and it's not advertised. Surely if somebody was seeking for truth, they would what? They would find it. In fact, one of our people then was summoned to police to give a statement. That is out of the country. Two, that was not going to bring back my girl. We had lost somebody. Now, I say in a statement that she was killed late in the night with a boy, already that is incriminating. I protect my own. You understand? Now, I deny her in her death because I need to satisfy the consciences of men whose hearts are already made up to misunderstand me. Because there are people who will misunderstand you. The people who follow us, don't follow us because they see everything in the spirit, but because they hear God. And they understand us even when we don't say anything. So what's the point of me trying to explain to people who don't even come to Fanero? Are you hearing what I'm saying? If I said, I'm going to protect my child. Me, if you're my own and I hear you in trouble there, I'll first get you out of danger, then I come here and we punch ourselves. But I can't let your name be destroyed there. And I tell people, learn to protect ministry. Learn to protect those people you're seated next to. Because those are the people who bury you. Those are the people who contribute to your weddings. Those are the people who attend the graduations of your children. Those are the people who come first at your homes when you lose parents and relatives. Those are the first people that come to you. Treat them like their family because you probably see them than you see many members of your own family and blood. So you have to protect your own. You understand what I'm saying? You have to. Someone just try and come and talk about Rachel. Now you know her. No, no, no. Have you talked to her? You know, don't discuss her then. Protect your own. Fight for your own. With a passion. Because we are all we have. But number three, I say this was not going to help the family that was mourning in any way. To hear that I've released the what? The scriptures tell us, mourn with them which are mourning. What we did, we mourned with them. And when I was in Boston, the mother of the girl met me and thanked me. She said, my girl, by the time she had died, she had started to understand God. She was testifying about who God was. And I believe it's the reason why she was coming out of that relationship. I say, glory to God. But how many people were denied the opportunity to come and hear the serving gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because of a foolish apostle? I don't even think he's an apostle. A foolish boy who calls himself an apostle. How does he live with it? How does he live with it? How does he live with it? How does he stand again and speak about Jesus? 
How do you educate a child to go and do a degree of mass comm, to wake up and go and destroy another man's destiny? You go to schools to come out and destroy destinies of other people in the name of mass comm. Your parents paid for you to destroy the lives of other people or to make lives better. Are you seeing what I'm saying? But what hurt me most was a man of God was in the center, in quotes. No, he's not even a man of God, but in quotes. Was in center, trying to destroy not only the vision, but the idea of the ministry to the public so men will not receive us the way we are supposed to be received. But Fanero continued growing. It continued. It continued. It continued. It continued. It continued. One time a guy said, he was a devil was spark, man he showed me in hell. One of our own called the guy and said, but you, why are you doing this? The guy said, Mundeke Nekolele Sente Zange. He said, leave me and I make my money. In other words, he discovered that Christians are so damn foolish that anybody can get on their altar and narrate a story. That is why. Yeah, I don't like stories of people who were former devil worshippers because I'm not against them crossing, but I would rather by the time they speak, they have been discipled. You understand what I'm saying? Because this young man discovered that in a church, he can go and disturb and make money, be offered money to speak. We investigated the fellow and discovered he was simply making money in churches. Now the churches that invited him and already had issues with the growing ministry were clapping. Now they can't invite him anymore because they discovered recently that the boy was playing <laughs> on their brains. He concocted a foolish story. But he mentioned innocent people's lives there. And the devil doesn't care about that. I think the young man would when he finally gets to his senses one day. But who would care? Would he care? No. But these are happening. And then you hear that believers are doing this to fellow believers. So they hold back men from entering the kingdom. And they themselves do not enter. Of course. God will hold them accountable. One day he will. These curls will follow. You can't continue being fake. One day a light shines and it says this is the person. Because you can't destroy lives like that. If you're a funeral member, I want you to understand. Hypocrisy has no place here. Gossip and slander has no place here. It has no place. If God brought you, let him sustain you here. If you came by a man, go back to that man who brought you. Are you hearing me? Because a man can be in a service in a church and be dissuaded out of the order of God by another kind of fellow who is doing worse than they are. Are you following what I'm saying? By another kind of fellow. I cannot tell you how many people have come to me saying, I'm sorry, I sat under a bad conversation about you. And then they mentioned the name of a person who I visited in hospital. And I'm like, hey, no, no. You understand what I'm saying? But that's okay. My part was done. There's a bigger reward for me. You understand what I'm saying? My reward is full. Avoid people that cause divisions among you. Be careful when somebody starts telling you about your pastors, your ministry. Be careful. Be careful when people start discussing ministers. Be careful. Because you might sit under the wrong conversation. You understand what I'm saying? It happens. And I thank God for me, the Lord graced me. When someone discusses me, I tell by how I talk with them. When someone has discussed me, 
my conversations with them die. I feel like I can't talk with them. And I, you be careful, people. Design very quickly. When you have someone who you regard as a friend, and then you feel you cannot talk with them anymore, or a stick deeper, you'll find that they're speaking about you. But for me, I sense it. I can sense when a man speaks about me. And some conversations, I even tell my wife before, and I say, I feel somebody say this about me. And then a few weeks later, she confirms by somebody telling us, oh, we're in a conversation and somebody spoke to me. That's not even in the realm of a prophet. No, I'm a man of God. I have to know. But sometimes I go back and I'm thinking, do you people know that sometimes amid the stars, devil worshippers come? That people from hell come and sit in our midst? And they are sent to dissuade innocent souls? You understand what I'm saying? So, some people are not from hell, but spirits work on their lives. They do. But they are welcome. Because me, I like them to come. I like the worshippers, people possessed. Because we've helped some. And some have come. I've received confessions of people who say, Apostle, I came to do this. I was sent to do this. And then I was transformed and I repent now. And we never discuss about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, Jesus says to them, Woe to you. Woe to you. Woe to you. And then he continues to say, One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense to make longer prayers. Therefore you shall receive a greater damnation. You know guys who do like that? They say, you know, the Lord has said, give me your house for this year so I can... You know, there's a lot there. I need to enter and be there and live there so that I can uh, sanctify it. There's a young man who bought a Benz and he submitted himself to a man of God who was his spiritual father. The moment he told me I knew this is a mistake, the spiritual father visits in a conference and says, by the way, that Benz you have outside. The after service, give me the keys. Because God has told me it's not yours. Spiritual father has spoken over his back. The young man gave the guy the keys. And I told my friend during that time, I told him, look at that young man. He might never drive a car again. It's been 12 years. He has never driven a car. And I'm still counting. Not because the mercy of God can't restore him. But he doesn't even know his error. I know in my spirit I design. He has not yet designed his error. Because this is me. That now I can bet before God. I have a clue on the person he was supposed to submit to. That is out of order. He bruised the certain man that blessed him years ago. And I know that was his authority. I know it. Because I know the words that man spoke in my presence over him and they came to pass. Until he finds that connection, eh? I don't see him restore. The ministry failed totally. He didn't even pastor more than 10 people. Yet the guy had gotten wealth. He lost it all under the wrong cover. I saw this happen with my eyes. He calls me when he's hungry to eat. And I give him food because I don't want to lose him until he comes to repentance. You understand what I'm saying? But these things are serious. They are serious. A little living will spoil the whole door. Some of you, one mistake like this can mess up your next 20 or 30 years of your life and ministry. One error like this. And you live lives like you don't know that one error can destroy you. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Woe unto you scribes, for ye camp a sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more than the child of hell than yourselves. Give me the message version so you'll understand it. He says, you are hopeless, you religious scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You go halfway around the world to make a convert, but once you get him, you make him into a replica of yourself, double downed. You understand? One sign 
of a living minister is a man who will impose his fatherhood over a person. One time a man came to me and told me, Apostle, I have made up my mind. We had never talked about anything. He just said, I've made up my mind. I'm going to father you. Ding! The red light went on. And as I was trying to recuperate from the disaster, he did like this. Should I fall in the arms of a father? I shouldn't I? I just came like a chicken. I went and deleted his number out of my phone. He looked for his son for months. Even sent people for his son. Tell a post I want to ordain him. I fled. You've never seen the open arm of a hypocrite. Naomi. I was like being invited into the valley of Baca. The brook of Kidron. Listen. Recently I was told of a fellow, he finishes preaching and he says, All of you want to be my spiritual son? Go and write there. Go and register quickly. Uh, there is somebody who is writing, you will find him in the back there. If you want to be my spiritual son? Go there and they write you. Man of God. Man of God. Is that how sons are begotten? No. Sons are begotten through relationship. That's how. That's how. How are you hearing me? It's relationship. They are drawn by God. They are not invited by you to sonship. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He says, I will bring your sons. That's what he says. I will bring your sons from the corners of the earth. He says, I will bring your sons. He didn't say, I will fly you to them. But do you know how many people say, the Lord has told me that I'm your spiritual mother. And the fool follows that. Are you hearing me? Have you ever seen that anywhere? It's not anywhere. It's not anywhere. It's not anywhere. That's not the way we beget children. No. No, that's not the right way. There are people God told me would submit two years ago. And I wait. I even write down in the diary. And some I even show them and they laugh. And I tell them, ah, this one, the one you're telling me, God told me June last year. And then they laugh. Because some of them, I need them to know that God had told me. You understand what I'm saying? That it wasn't just a mistake. And there are some who have come to submit and I told them, let me pray. And I take a year and I don't reply. I'm telling you. Because fathering is price. It's responsibility. Somebody shout hallelujah. He says, woe unto you blind guides which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it's nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple is a better. They don't want you to swear by the temple, but they want you to swear by the gold. Because gold is profit. So in the literal translation, they submit men to activities of their personal profit because they are men of God. There's a difference between giving to a man of God and a man of God taking from you. That one is manipulated. I know someone in this ministry, a certain man called them, not in this ministry, though, the man was from another ministry, said, the Lord has told me that you are the one to pay fees for my children. And the person came to me and said, Apostle, to pay fees. I told them, ah, that's not God. I asked them, why? I asked them, has God told you to pay fees? He says, no, Apostle. I told them, then don't waste your time on such foolishness. Banan, if I just chose to be hypocrite, some of us are too smart, we even fear ourselves. Come, I am Paramagus. Sometimes, eh, I even feel it. Then sometimes it becomes so much, and I'm like, eh, apostle. So if we are smart enough, listen, I could get every coin out of you in just seconds. Because I'm anointed. I could. I could. Because you believe in me, don't you? Yes, you do. 
So I could manipulate and say, now, eh? now, eh? but that is so wrong. It means I'm killing something bigger. That is why some churches are drying. Because God is taking responsibility out of certain men. I went in a certain church to preach and I didn't collect the money that they wanted. And these guys told me, uh -uh, you'll not be called back. <laughs> you don't know how to. What is Ukukora? Are you following what I'm saying? And these preachers think we are so dumb. No, we are not. But we see them dumb. We see they're the dumb ones. Because they are killing something bigger for something smaller. They are going off the tangent of God's principle. And they think they can establish another way. There are some churches that you must have like four baskets of seeds. I know someone who told me, Apostle, may I get change when I'm going to church? I go to a shop and I tell someone, give me change of 2K, 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 2K. And then I change that change, like 20K or something like that. And then I what? And then I hold it. Yes. Now we are going to give this seed of what? Now we need to build, we need to build. Uh, let me see, uh, they just get an idea. We need money for the lights. The message of the light. I feel light is going to shine on someone. Uh, get a seed for the light. So the light. There are 17 lights that can shine on your life. Get a seed for the light. Somebody get a seed for the light. Then after a few weeks, I want 200 people to be giving me 5 million for the Holy Spirit. Come. Boldly come. Then the 200 come. For the what? Over what is money for the Holy Spirit? But there is money for the what? For the Holy Spirit. It's not accounted for. It's not audited. You don't know where it goes. And when these guys were talking to me one day, they told me why they call people he said, you know, these days, even our cash people tuck in the basket, the guy told me. And so, sometimes, you need to have a rough picture of what is in the basket. So they will call 200 people with a million, right? And then they count 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, okay. If 120 have come, rough estimate, give or take. 20 might not give or don't have the money, so 8 I will give or 9. So I expect something within 97, 98 there. How do I get it to 150? Okay, those of 50 million come. Come. Ribra kabakata. Pakata labanti tebategera. Zile keba kata la pateva soma Bible. Abatama nivya wandi. Kibwa bakate lepa abasiru siru. Gore pala abazole zole. God is going to surprise you. Then the 50 also what? Bring their money. He says, Shababa. Abala mo 50. That's about 120. I'm remaining the 30 million. Who here can say that apostle? I'm willing to add this. I need three people. Then they refuse. Sister Begu, I just heard you had a job recently. Then he gets his money, collects it now. Let him find less than 130 or 40. You are in trouble. And Yanziba. Who is robbing you? About Uganda, that is happening. 
And let me tell you, people with the spirit of poverty, give those men, eh? that's the spirit that attracts them, because it's a devouring spirit. It's a devouring spirit. We just need to teach people the principles. That is why in Vanera I don't pressure you, because if you know God and love him, of course, there is someone who, because they are not pressured, they don't give. But I would rather not receive out of your deception to sustain the kingdom. I have to get money at every cost. This is not my ministry. Let him build it. But I'm not going to get money from you at every cost. For the Bible says the Lord loves the what? A cheerful giver. Give me the message of that. He says, I want each one of you to take plenty of time to think it over. Make up your own mind what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and I'm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. God loves that. Let him reward you against that. And of course, I know that's an excuse for people not to be big givers. That's their problem, not mine. I'm rich. You understand what I'm saying? And the ministry is what? Is rich. We just need to teach our people to learn to be big givers. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about big. But you cannot twist men into that. It has to be a revelation. Because some people are still struggling to believe the revelation of tithing. When you talk about giving big, they don't understand. I've given more than 70% or so for the last three or four years of my life. And I will tell you, God has almost tripled my income every year. So I know what it is to give God. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about giving big, something that costs, and then you say, God, this one, eh? Ah! Woo! You understand what I'm saying? And then you start a joy in your heart and say, I know who I believe. That's an exercise. It's a grace. Someone grows into it. If I am twisted, you'll not get a reward. I would rather you keep your thing. You understand what I'm saying? Because that is how love should be. And let me correct this. Nobody can outgive God. Some people say you can overgive. There is no such thing in the kingdom as overgiving. It's not, it doesn't exist. No. The Bible says he that sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. There is no man who overbountifies. It's not there. Second Corinthians 9.6. Let's read the Bible. No man can overgive. That's the Western mindset. That's a Western mentality. It's not a biblical one. You understand what I'm saying? But that is supposed to be spirit-led, not twisted arms. I mind what I give you, not what you give me, what I give you. Because it's more blessed to what? To give than to receive. So don't think that we are dumb because we don't talk about it. Or that your seed will not multiply because I didn't pray. God knows the heart that sowed. You don't need me to say God bless you for you to be blessed when you have sowed in the right revelation, in the cheer and leading of your heart. If God leads you to give a hundred shillings, give that one. Don't give us more. We will not hang you. You understand what I'm saying? Make it the madness that is in the church. Some of these guys were in a meeting one time when a man took an offering, manipulated for like, you know that Paul talked about giving like for 35 minutes. After talking about it, now they say, now what? Now give. One hour. Now what? Now give. Because it's the only way people will give. That's why every year our giving doubles. You know why? Because people in this ministry have gotten it. You don't need to manipulate men to give to your ministry. Unless you don't believe God. When you're a believer in God, you learn to believe him full circle. That's the heart that is established in faith. That's the perfect heart in Chronicles. With whom the Lord looks to and fro to show himself strong on its behalf. The perfect heart is the heart that has believed God. That whether it's what or what, God will avail this. If I can't teach you that faith, how can you have it? No wonder people in those churches are broke. They're the biggest givers, but they are broke because they are not giving in the what? In the revelation. One guy sat us in a meeting, took all the money from the people. Then after that, I think one of us preached about it was me. Then he came back on the pulpit and said, Now, I feel like you should bring more money. Bring! You're not the ones who are anointing on me. I said, Bring. People ran and gave money. And he got all the money and disappeared. The next day they were calling me to pay for the building where he had service. I feared believers.
one man <laughs> was ordained in some office. Then he stood in front of people and said, Moe, didn't you hear that I was ordained as a... Why didn't you give me money? Huh? When they have ordained me. Bring money quickly! Those who go to change, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Fill the pulpit by fire, by force. <laughs> Take heed of the living <laughs> of the Pharisees. Are you learning something? Yes, you fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? So why are you talking about the gold? And then they get to the altar and they say, no, don't swear about the altar. Swear against the gift that you bring on the altar. So God asks them, which is more important? The gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? So God says, no, a promise is a promise. Don't twist people's arms. Are you hearing me? That is why in this ministry you have not seen us say, God is the best giver. We celebrate him for giving. Because, I'll explain that. Why should we do that? Where is their reward in God? And how do you know that they're the biggest giver? Because they gave two million out of their hundred million. And there's a student who gave her pocket money. Her 50,000 of that week. And she gave it all. Who is the bigger giver? So how do we know? How can I celebrate you the giver when I don't know your income? Even if I did, what is that to you? Are you following what I'm saying? I don't want to take your reward. I'll read it later. Now the next verse says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you pay tithes of mint and nisa and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the Lord, judgment, mercy, and faith. And he says, This you ought to have done and not to leave the others. You blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within you are full of extortion. 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like and too witted sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanliness. He says, even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. One, two, you scribes and Pharisees, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, and ye children of them which kill the prophets. 34 says, wherefore, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them which which you shall kill and crucify. They say, oh, if you were there, how could we kill the Lord? They even preach. And they killed my man. <laughs> and then after that, they get a young man who is having a dream. And they speak evil things about him to destroy his ministry. And they are here weeping that their Lord <laughs> was crucified. They killed the prophets. They killed them. And the same man, after service goes and then starts to tell you, you see that Emma? What? 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 They are killing people, yet they are garnishing the sepulchres of dead men. We remember the death of a man who died for the gospel, but you're killing kids. You're killing your kids. That's why I tell a man of God, it doesn't matter how bad your children be, never curse your child. Me, yeah, I don't curse. Sometimes I see what's going to befall someone and I can say what I see. But it's not because I've cursed them. But I will never pronounce a curse over my own. Even if they are white. You do everything you want to me. But if you're mine, you've sat under this ministry, I can't curse you. You know how many boys have been cursed by their spiritual fathers? One man told a girl, you'll eat dust for as long as you live. Go out of the church. There when they say it, you say no. I will eat meat in Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout glory to God. And so, remember when I was beginning, I said, your worship and your what? Your what? Your doctrine. Let me touch worship a bit. The next meeting I'll touch doctrine. There are public worships. When I preach, I'm publicly ministering. When they're worshiping, they're publicly ministering. The usher that is laying the chairs, the security guys that are making sure the security is coming in, the welfare people that are making sure that they are fed, that is public ministry and worship. But there is private worship, and there are three entities that define private worship. There could be more, but I know three major ones. 
one, giving. Tell your neighbor, giving is a private affair. Matthew speaks about all of this in Matthew chapter 6. Okay? He says, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. That's why we don't speak who gave, because the moment we speak it, your payment is done. Now, if I love you, I must make sure that I protect your giving. That's why even our partners have cords. Because you don't need to know who gave. I also don't go back in the books to know who gave what. Why? Because I want you to have a full reward. Give me the message version of that. He says, when you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors, I call them. Treating prayer meetings and street corners like a stage. Acting compassionate as long as someone is watching. Playing to the crowds and they get applause through, but that's all they get. There are people who can only give in public. Back in the day I went to a church, one of those churches, one Baptist church, and there was a guy who was a pastor. You know those young men who swell it? He was a youth pastor, but I think who was appointed before his time. So he used to walk like this. Of like I'm more important than you all, by the way, is the reason why I'm a pastor and you're not. If you don't respect me, it's your problem. You know those guys who even walk slowly to show that I'm getting money anytime, a car is coming anytime. So one of those days there was this guy who was dancing on the pulpit and dancing a very funny way. So he was entertaining and everyone was laughing and people came to give him money because he was a favorite guy in the church and everyone was giving and giving him. So this guy waited when everyone had given. You know those guys who wait to make sure that everyone has given. Listen, I'm not against you blessing what blesses you. I tell people I do that always. When a man of God has told something and I feel my spirit has connected, I don't know what happens. I sign a check. That's me. And some of you do it. That when a message comes, we're not doing that to buy, but we are responding and reacting to something we feel connects to us in a deeper way than anybody attending that day. That's the power of revelation. We respond to revelation in this ministry. We do. So it's not bad for that. But this is what this guy did, and I carried 20,000 to demonstrate it, because that date was a 20K. Now, in 2005, 2006, 20K was 20K. I don't know how I can explain to someone born in 1998, 1996, what 20K was one day. And you will never understand, but 20K was 20K. So this guy then had money in his pocket. And so he waited for everyone to give, and as people were laughing, the song is almost ending. So this guy gets the money. I kid you not. He held it, and he was laughing too. He did like this. He gets his money from the pocket. And then he says, You know what he was telling us? <laughs> I am giving 20k. If I can give 20k for a show, just the guy singing, yes. And I give 20k. One time we at a show, and this guy gets money. He starts beating it to a musician. Great. In public. Great. But me in the spirit, I could say, say you guys, eh? I have money. My cheek, I'm broke. Eh? No, I got it right here. I got it. You understand? And those things are in black men. You, you look through history. It's only black men that put money in front of them on a picture. I've never seen Zuckerberg do it. I've never seen uh, Bill Gates do it. I've never seen Warren Buffett do it. Jack Ma, I've never seen any of those do it. But a command just punches one guy, and then he puts money in front. The man is him, yeah, and then he puts money in front of him like this with shirts, licking his lips. That's an enslaved mentality. 
Tell your neighbor, we refuse that in the name of Jesus. Giving is an act of worship. According to the revelation you have toward God. He says your left arm should not know what the right hand has done. There are many people have blessed and I told them, please, why? Because I want my reward full. Said, should I tell I don't know, it's okay. You can tell everyone. You can tell everyone. In fact, I will tell them for you. I'm the one who bought that guy. That's, and uh, I'm the one, you see that one here? The bag she has. Ronnie's phone? Yes. Tell your neighbor, our worship is not that way. In verses 5, he talks about prayer. Give the message version again. He says, and when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production. Some people pray as if they're in theater. Right? All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? I'm not talking about a person who you'll find praying vehemently. But I'm talking a person who you'll find praying. Remember, he's praying. So people, because you don't judge everyone who's praying. There's a person who is praying and they are taken by the spirit of prayer. But there's also another one praying saying, see me, I'm bad. I'm bad. Can you do this? Can you do this? I'm bad. Oh, you've not prayed yet. Can you do this? I'm not saying everyone who does that is that. But there are people who do that in theater. They are doing theatrics. Somebody shout hallelujah. And he says, here's what I want you to do. He says, find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage and the focus will shift from you to God and you'll begin to sense his grace. All right? Let's go to the last 16th verse. He's talking about fasting. He says, when you practice some appetite-denying discipline to better concentrate on God, he says, don't make a production. Eh? The other one was theater. This one is production, a whole production. I wish you know what production is. Some people make a production, like ABC Productions. This is the film of a fasting woman. Are you hearing me? And he says, and it might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it won't make you a what? A saint. He says, if you're going to training, he says, inwardly. Hmm? Act no more outwardly. Tell your neighbor, act no more. The Bible says shampoo. Comb your hair. Brush your teeth. Wash your what? Your face. I heard somebody years ago, there's a lady I remember many years ago. <laughs> now when she's fasting, eh? Even when she's walking, you don't want to cross her road. Because she walks like this. This woman never used to iron her clothes in fasting period. They had even started identifying. Years ago, Oh, you're going number. Because when she's fasting, ah, yeah, yeah, the hair fasts. The clothes fast. The face fast. Everything on them fasts. You look at a person and they look like a deserted island with crocodiles on it. You understand what I'm saying? But they're what? Recently, I looked at a young man. I think a guy had a very bad issue he was working in a fasting, the year of redemption. I told him, go, 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 the jacket that way. Year of redemption, fire, year of redemption. Memorandum, what? What are you redeeming? <laughs> I told him, don't come back with it. Okay, okay, Apostle, I'm sorry. You understand? But that's how people think. Some people, when they go fasting, Ay, 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 Mama, osi gango obu mwa. You understand? Are you hearing me? You understand? That's the day you go to the what? Now people, 
meet you and they think you're just from having lunch. Nenga, you're fasting. That is rightful fasting. And there are people who know how to narrate their fasting periods. You know, uh, you know I'm fasting. Praise God. Verse 18 says, God doesn't require attention getting devices. He won't overlook what you're doing. He'll reward you well. Hallelujah. Hypocrites do the opposite of these three. These three. These three. Somebody shout amen. God help us. Passion work. Have a true. Changing me. We have come in the Yes, and where? Speak another time. Spray the spirit. The prison for our apprehend that which Christ also apprehended that's for and this we will do by your help in Jesus name Somebody say amen. if you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today you're going to repeat these words after me say Lord Jesus thank you for dying for me today I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord of my life. I'm born again. Amen. God bless. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com you can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org or better still feel free to join us every thursday for our weekly fellowship at uma multipurpose hall from 5 p.m to 8 p.m you can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash sonero sonero make manifest